Paul Verhaag. Is the mic working? First of all, thank you for the invitation. It's, of course, an honor to be... This one. You've got one. You've got a lapel. Okay. It's an honor to be here in this place uh, to be able to introduce my book to you. I guess most of you are working in or at least familiar with the mental health uh, care sector. And then you will know that nowadays it is widely assumed that uh, mental disorders such as depression, ADHD, uh, anxiety disorders, etc., etc., that they are supposed to be expressions of underlying neurobiological processes and possibly genetically based as well. And today medication is a solution. Talking is often considered only a supplementary support. My position as an analyst is diametrically opposed to this. In my opinion, many psychiatric problems have a hidden and somewhat insidious social moral undertones. Individuals are expected to live up to an ideal image that society imposes upon us. And it is the individual's failure and even their success in the plight to meet this ideal that makes them sick. This is of course a revival of the classic Freudian thesis uh, proposed in civilization and its discontents. And that's why I'm so happy to present the book over here. Of course, Freud's vision was far more nuanced than the simplistic anti-society attitude so often ascribed to him. What Freud suggested was that between society and the individual, there is a point of tension where an individual's desire should and indeed must conform to the norms and expectations of society. The question is, what are the different forms that this point of tension can take? And one must assume that different social structures will lead to different processes of identity formation and hence to different kinds of mental disorders. And that's the main thesis, of course. And this reasoning brought me to, this, to distinguish between three different types of society which always have a serious impact on identity and on psychopathology. I call them the Victorian society, the post-May 68 society, and finally the Enron society. Alternatively, we could call them the age of the right orgasm, the age of compulsory free love, and finally our age, that of purchasing every any possible enjoyment. I can be quite brief on the Victorian model, because it is the model with which we are most familiar. It is a patriarchal society in which the accent is entirely on prohibition. Furthermore, it is explicitly coupled with a traditional class structure and a dominant religion. There is hardly room for the individual who merely forms part of a coercive society. And it is no accident that psychoanalysis uh, emerged out of this kind of society. And an over coercive morality came to be seen as a cause of mental illness. As you all know, Freud did not hesitate to adopt a clear ethical position on this relationship between society and the individual. Neurosis is at least partly created by an, an excessively strict moral code in which sexuality finds pathological outlets through neurotic symptoms. Therefore, the implicit norm for successful treatment is that the individual should achieve orgasm in the right way and not succumb to neurasthenic masturbation, angst, ridden abstinence, hysterical frigidity or obsessive fear of germs. For therapeutic reasons, according to Freud, the analyst will often have to combat an overstrict superego as well as what he calls the cultural Super ego. At the same time, he is convinced that the analyst should never adopt the role of savior or guru. The aim of treatment is to give the subject enough freedom to make his own ethical choices. 
This brings us to May 68, the effect of which is the reverse of the Victorian model. This is reflected in the particular developments in the field of human rights. The Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 was intended primarily for specific groups. It dealt with the rights of women, of children, and it also involved com community concerns such as the right to education, medical care, and so on. But from the 60s, it became increasingly concerned with the liberation of individuals. It was the era of the autonomous self and the authentic personality, preferably enjoying as many rights as possible. And the problems people brought to the consulting room did not differ that much from those of the previous era, but yet people expected and received different I'm, You can look at it from the point of view of uh, Foucault, uh, or from the point of view of the American, whose name escapes me, right? Yeah, uh, Kuhn, Thomas Kuhn, uh, meaning that uh, it is a set of beliefs, and once a set of beliefs has, uh, sh has been shared by a large number of people, it doesn't need to be proved any longer. It just perpetuates itself for a number of, of decades even. That's right now. Everybody is convinced that it is neurobiological, that it is genetically determined, and if you look at the genuine scientific papers, there is no proof whatsoever, uh, which is really not strange. Uh, at the same time, there is enough, more than enough evidence, that most mental disorders have to do with socioeconomic situations, with social situations, uh, going from uh, family situations to larger uh, social uh, stuff. Uh, and then it becomes interesting, especially if you, if you have to teach diagnostics, because a number of things have been changing. We don't see the same kind of neurosis that were treated by Freud and his daughter here in this house. We see different disorders. Uh, and that has to do with a change in, in the norms and values that has to do with the change on the social level. Uh, let's say that uh, we have made a shift, a transition from an, an, an over-regulated society to an under-regulated one in matters of sexuality. But we have an over-regulation on another level, and that makes people ill. So basically, it's the same over-regulation, but not so long, not anymore on the level of sexuality and male-female relationship on that level. You can do whatever you want, as long as you pay for it. Uh, we have a trouble with a different kind of regulation. The idea of efficiency of the, the the human being turned into a productive machine. And that makes people ill nowadays. That's so, so the expression of, I mean, what, what you find in the consulting room mm. is different. Yes. And the difference you think is to do, in analyzing this book, is yeah. to do with, with the various forms that the uh, yeah. rank and yank culture yeah. takes. Okay, so, so tell us a little bit more about the, the kinds of diagnoses that yeah. you might be asked to give yeah. to your patients and why you are asked to give them rather than to work with them in different ways. Yeah, basically, the, the shift that we have seen uh, in the consultation room is that we see much more anxiety uh, problems and uh, depression. Uh, depression has to do with the, the system of the loser, being called a loser, and if you, if you go back to Freud and his main studies on uh, depression, it's quite obvious that depression has to do with the loss of identity. And that's also the main complaint of someone who is, who feels depressed. I don't mean anything, uh, I would never mean anything for anyone, uh, I can't succeed, etc., etc. So that's, that's basically depression. And it used to be related to personal relations. Nowadays, depression is related to the professional level because people fall out of a job, fall out of a professional career. Uh, anxiety, most, in most cases, they are mixed. Anxiety has to do with the anxiety and the uncertainty uh, on, the, on the matters of labor, on the work flow. Uh, nobody is sure uh, of his job any longer. Uh, most of my younger colleagues are on a tenure track, meaning that they have, that they have to work very hard without being, without having any certainty uh, about their career. It's very bad for women as well, because uh, if you want to combine a career and having children, well, you will do both of them uh, in a way that's not very satisfactory. 
So those are the main things that we see in a consultation room. Anxiety and depression. And then the third one, of course, uh, is personality disorders, uh, which is basically identity disorder. Identity has become very unstable, very superficial, uh, and that has to do with the change in the system as well. And, and do you think, because there are changes in the family which are linked to the system, and, and yeah. what happens there? And, and yeah. perhaps say a little bit about authority. Uh, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about it uh, half an hour ago. Uh, the, the family, as we used to know, doesn't exist any longer. We all know that, uh, and at the same time, we still uh, continue to use the, 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 the words family, father, mother, but it's completely different. Uh, just to give you one example, um, the fathers of the previous times didn't care about their children that much. My father I had a very good father, but my father didn't care about my education or whatever that was stuff for the females, for the mother and in the house. And at the same time, he had lots of authority. Every father had authority at that time and didn't bother with his children. Nowadays, we have two kinds of fathers. We have the fathers who are just missing, who are not there. And we have the very conscious fathers who are trying to be as good as possible uh, with their children. And they don't have any authority whatsoever left. So that's the problem. They are much more into fatherhood and they don't have any authority left. Uh, and this has to do with a fundamental change in the symbolic system. But that's a whole different issue. We can go into that tomorrow morning, I'm afraid. Well, people may want to ask you questions about that. I, I will ask you one more yeah. and then leave it to you. Um, you begin the book with a very, very graphic scene. Yes. And it's a scene, when I started reading it, I thought, oh my God, we're in Abu Ghraib. Yeah. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're in the scene of, of torture. Yeah. Um, and in fact, well, I don't, I don't want to spoil the pattern, let yeah. you do the punchline, but in fact, we're actually in an ordinary situation, yeah. an ordinary everyday happening, yeah. you say. Now, I happen to have the, the great privilege of being freelance, and I don't work in any organizations, but you, you claim, that you claim that, that in organizations, yeah. this particular form of event is yeah. not Unusual. So, can you say a little bit about these forms of bullying? Because I still yeah. find it quite hard to believe that it's there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's on the internet, so you can see it if you don't believe it. Um, it's what I called it uh, at a certain point, and of course, I did not invent that uh, expression. It's what I called the bicycle reflex, uh, kicking down and, and, and pushing upwards. If people uh, are put into uh, a situation in which they have to compete with everybody else, in which you have that rank and uh, yang system, you create aggression and you create uh, an, 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 yeah, a kind of a traumatic scenery in which the one who gets traumatized will try to get rid of it by traumatizing the other. We know that from clinical practice, so people who have been abused run a great risk of, of becoming abusers themselves. But that happens on the short time scale as well. You don't need to be abused when you are six years old and you are 27 to abuse somebody else. It happens, can happen within two weeks as well on the work floor. And this is what is happening all over. Uh, after that incident uh, in Belgium, there was a huge survey trying to because everything has to be quantified uh, today, uh, trying to find out if this was really exceptional or uh, if this was something that uh, happened more than people uh, expected. And it turned out to be not exceptional at all, on the contrary. So this is a sign of the times, bullying on the work floor. With normal people, it is Abu Ghraib on the work floor, and it's almost the same. And, I mean, you, you, you talk very um, interestingly in the book about what's happened in terms of the quantification yeah. of all our evaluation systems, if you like, the quantification yeah. of everything, which is partially linked to the, of course, on the arrival and takeover of the computer. Now, w what impact does that have on our uh, symbolic world, it makes on us, our everyday uh, life? It makes us stupid. It... it uh, that just to give you an example, uh, 
I've been working at university, at university for at least 25 years now, uh, and we have what we call the faculty meeting, and it used to be a very important meeting, because that is the meeting where we made important decisions. Um, and, of course, this meeting is a perfect, I would call it, is a perfect item to see the evolution. And uh, nowadays, the faculty meeting takes something like 25 minutes. It used to take half a day. Now it's 25 minutes. There's no discussion whatsoever. And every meeting starts with uh, spreadsheets. And based on the spreadsheets, the decisions are already taken. And nobody asks where the uh, figures are coming from, how they have been assembled, uh, what uh, statistical operations have been done on it. And around the table, there are scientists and clever people who are working uh, in research. There is no discussion whatsoever. The, the, the numbers are there and the decisions are made. That's it. So it makes us stupid. Stupid and uh, irresponsible. Okay. Um, it, it's not all gloom and doom. <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> it's changing. But, it but questions, changing. please, from you. Yeah. We just have a few minutes to do that. Are there any questions based on what Paul has said? Okay, I'll, I'll start here because there was a hand first. Thank you very much for your talk and for your book, which I'll enjoy any time intellectually and theologically. In fact, I read it for the Lord of the Scottish Referendum on Independence, which was vital, alive, incredibly strong one. So the way you structure things is so important. Uh, um, very briefly, I think what you said about politics implies in it. My two to three strategies. And what happened with this oatmeal was you had to dissect it and look at them again. And things that were psychologically you kind of kind of fudged with the degree of tolerating this that were important you had to look at. And um, one of the main issues between the two camps was precisely what we were talking about in terms of kind of society. Yeah. And in particular, you uh I can talk to the Scottish side. Basically, the belief was that London is the source of predatory capitalism, mm-hmm. uh, fueled by a government that's used to be the nurse for the private schools and headed by the Manette government. Whereas in Scotland, we were the um, saints and virtuous people who went to social justice and equality. Uh, so this is a touch of truth of that, but not as much as it was preserved. Yeah. And trying to, to go through that and examine how um, maybe we were as good as we and uh, etc. It's really a tremendous turmoil. And uh, for me, it led to a readjustment of my identity in a strange way. Uh, I have, sorry, have you got a question? Because there's oh, so sorry. little time. Sorry. And I'm not sure Paul's up on the well, Scottish my independence. My question was really in how we apply this to nationhood. I think it just had us with those identity changes. Yeah. Well, I think. Um, of course, it, it didn't follow th- that discussion as much as you, you must have done over here. But I think it is an advantage if that kind of discussion opens up a discussion about the values and about the ethics, and not so much about a romantic nationalism going back to whatever uh, medieval time. If it is a discussion whether you want this kind of uh, social system or another kind of social system, then I am over the discussion. Because it, it gives a political impetus to to a com- contemporary situation. And we haven't seen that kind of discussion for the last 15 years or 20 years, at least not in Belgium and not in, in Holland. Uh, they were only discussing uh, about uh, the, the insurance rate and the, the, the banking system, not about social values. But it's an advantage, whatever the, the exit of the But you do have it in, in terms of your populist politicians, don't you? You do always bring up the uh, perpetual yeah. questions of national identity. Yes, uh, but their hidden agenda, which is not that much hidden, is purely economic, because that's always the case, and you must be aware of that. Uh, it's not about uh, one part of the country and nation, whatever, against the other. It's the richest part against the poorest part. Flanders nowadays is the richest part of Belgium, 
And they want to get rid of the southern part because they are poor, just like Italy, the northern part is the richest, and they want to get rid of the south because they are poor. So, and it's hidden behind another agenda, uh, but you don't need to be that clever to see it. Mm -hmm. There, and then you start. Yes. You want to stand up so we can hear you better. I will give you an example. Uh, so the whole system uh, comes down to evaluation, to rank and yank. And that happens already nowadays, at least in Belgium, with the toddlers. And we call it early detection. Not even early diagnosis, early detection. I'm, I'm a Lacanian, so I'm a very sensible, for, very keen on, on, on words and signifies early detection. Uh, and they want to single out the children as early as possible to see whether they have a disorder or, or whatsoever. This is really stupid. Children are children. They have so many possibilities to, 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 to develop that whatever you can see in a two-year-old may not be there any longer when that child is three years of age or whatever. But nowadays they receive already a label uh, at that age. They are tested all over. But I'm not sure whether I will find the exact English uh, words. A friend of mine uh, had a daughter who was at that time four years of age. It goes back to another And uh, it was invited. She, she uh, went to what you call kindergarten, nursery school. Uh, and uh, he, was in, he and uh, his wife were invited to school for a, a, a parent, uh, evening. Parent evening, yes, I didn't know they had parent evenings at that uh, stage when uh, my children were younger, didn't exist. And they were told that, uh, knippen, what they were in, in English, knippen, knippen, the cuts, that the, uh, and vaardigheden, they were told that the cutting abilities of their daughter were not up to the mark. <laughs> yeah. The cutting abilities of a four year old were not up to the mark. So there was something wrong with the child. And, uh, the father. <laughs> the scissor hands. The sc like scissor like hands, scissor. yes. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the father, who <laughs> is a keen intellectual, started to love his head off, whatever, because she found it very amusing and then didn't do much. But we had a discussion uh, about it. And I said to him, just imagine that, uh, this message is given to a parent who is 28 years of age. age. Not you here in his late thirties, uh, but to uh, a father or mother with 28 or 27, they will get anxious. There's something wrong with my child. My child will not be able to make it. We have to do something about it. And they start to get worried. And of course, then you have the whole mirroring system that wor those worries are mirroring to the child, etc. And things are happening in that way nowadays. So it has an effect on very, very young children. And this is official, that detection system I'm talking about will be instituted by the government. It was so a very is interesting um, analysis of the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual in, in the book as well. Yes. Yes. Estella. Wait, I'll tell you, yes, that's the point that was placed before. That is that, okay, from the 60s, I mean, we didn't have any information about that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's not only about competition, uh, because when I was uh, at school, uh, there was lots of competition at that time as well. Uh, it depends on the ethical system in which competition takes place. Uh, we were raised, after the, the Second World War, uh, within an ethics of community. Uh, we had to be very good, we had to study very hard in order to create something new, not in the first place for ourselves, uh, or indeed for ourselves in the plural. And nowadays the competition within the contemporary ideology is only individual. You have to make it for you, as an individual, uh, not for the other, not for the community. And that's the big difference. And that was introduced into the school system and by and large into the society as such because we didn't recognize that it was an ideology. We thought that we got rid of ideology uh, in the early 70s, that was the Fukuyama, the end of history, the end of uh, ideology, and we didn't see that, uh, uh, that neoliberalism as an ideology was taking over, especially in, in the work, uh, in the corporate government, in the government, corporate world, and then afterwards in the educational system. So we missed that. Question right at the back, and then you. Well, um, one of the uh, dangerous effects of this system, and I, I have mentioned it in my talk, but I didn't go into it that much, one of the dangerous things of this system is that it puts us individually apart, one from another. And one of the main reactions that I got to my book in uh, Belgium and Holland was that people started to talk about it. And that people who, who were sitting next to one another, who has, who had been sitting next to one another for the last three or three years in the office, didn't knew that they had the same feelings about the way the job was organized. And the fact that they discovered that the other had the same opinion brought them together and uh, there were people who started to react. Uh, so individualism, it, it's, it's the classic, uh, style, divide et impera, divide them and you will rule them. Uh, so the answer is, instead of being divided, unite. Unite, come together with other people and start to do something. Uh, because on your own, you can't react. I think one of the interesting points in your book that you make is, is, is the way the individualism is actually... Because, you know, when you think of individualism, you also think of the artist as a model, a creative yeah. model. And your form of individualism is an economic model. Yeah. But it also has, uh, as its, its regulating sphere, yeah. this, the growth parallel, growth of a very large bureaucracy, yes. a regulatory mm -hmm. bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, crucial in understanding what goes on in schools and universities um, and mm -hmm. indeed throughout social services today. So, that's just another point. There's a question here. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Okay, you have two questions. Uh, first of all, I'm quite happy with your first question, which is more a remark um, about the uh, pessimistic undertone or even overtone of the book. The book was originally published in uh, Dutch in uh, mid-2012, uh, so that's uh, almost three, uh, two years ago. Uh, in the meantime, a number of things have changed. Uh, and if I would write a book now, it would have a different ending. It would uh, have a more optimistic uh, concluding chapter, because a number of things are really changing. Uh, the, the book was actually finished before the economic meltdown, before the financial crisis. And the financial crisis has uh, operated as a wake-up call. And uh, Just to give you an example, uh, the Dutch language is a very limited languages, we are only some 20 million people speaking and reading it, there have been published at least six books about democracy in the last year and a half, and they are selling huge numbers. People are talking again about politics, and they are written by people who are not into politics. That's the main thing about it. So there is an, an understream coming up uh, about a political consciousness that goes against the official politi uh, politicians. Uh, so this is really amazing, and something is, 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 is happening uh, right now. So I'm not optimistic in that respect. Then the second thing about psychology, uh, in that respect I'm very pessimistic. So I, I have written a book which has not been uh, translated into English. The title uh, uh, was published some six years ago, five years ago. The title is The End of Psychotherapy. Uh, psychotherapy has become, by and large, part of this system. Just take the DSM, the Diagnostic Manual, they are all about social disorders. They are all about people who are not meeting the social criteria. And the uh, Freedmans are meeting people adjust the social criteria. The most used word in the DSM is the, uh, the word to, in many different variations, but uh, 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 a certain char characteristic is either too much present or not enough present. And therapy consists of adjusting the, the too much or the too little. So this is psychology and psychiatry today. So I'm very pessimistic about that. Okay, um, could you, I think we don't have time for more than one question. We'll take one here. I'm sorry. Maybe two. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> one there and one here, and then we'll have to go downstairs and do a little bit. Yes, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that this Well, 
Well, I think our reaction, first of all, should be an ethical reaction. That uh, we uh, function as a wake-up call in whatever function that we are operating. I teach at university, I work in clinical practice. Uh, I am voicing this ethical position, and it, at least in my country, it gets attention. And then, on that point, we also give a psychotic explanation. I don't do it in the reverse way, because otherwise my voice, my voice will not be heard. Now, the second uh, question uh, about authority. Uh, this is really the big issue. Uh, because it's obvious that um, this system functions in a totally different way in matters of authority. Uh, it's also obvious for me that patriarchy is finished. And it's also obvious that we should not return to that situation. Uh, it's that fundamental. Uh, and it's also obvious for me that we should not uh, try or advocate a return to the period of patriarchy. Uh, although some analysts uh, are thinking in that way. So the big question is how will we uh, think authority in a post Enron era? And we are heading towards, towards a post uh, Enron era. And uh, we were talking half an hour ago about the, the uh, arrival again of feminism and the fact that it is really necessary that we, we need feminism again uh, because this neoliberal system is against uh, femininity and against uh, the rights that we had acquired in the 70s. So that's, that's the big question, but I don't know the answer. I'm sorry, we're, you can talk more downstairs. Yeah. Let me just take the last question here, please. Uh, hey, Diamond, uh, good day, that's all. But just a quick question. You said something earlier about um, the country failed the rich parts of the third country. Yeah. Yeah. You said that's the text. But the, the, well, agen the, agenda yeah. the agenda is that uh, the, the richest part of the country wants to get rid of the poorest part. That's the agenda. Okay. But what are they saying? Uh, that depends on the country, of course. Oh, and, and, and more or less the same thing. In, in Belgium, it is hidden behind a nationalistic and historical. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. I, I, Paul has worked very, very hard. <laughs> Having travelled here sorry. today, <laughs> um, please give him a big hand. And, um, thank you. And thank him. And come downstairs and have a drink and um, have a look at the books. <laughs>